Good morning, Bibliotes. Welcome again to your channel, Cronista de Indias, with Professor Andrea Lorena Fernandez. Thank you for your interest in Latin American study. Today's episode is titled Season 1, Episode 4, Guadalupe and Marianismo, the other face of machismo. In the previous episode about La Malinche and La Chingada, Season 1, Episode 3, we began discussing the dichotomy between La Malinche, or the mother traitor, and Guadalupe, the holy mother. Some call this dichotomy the virgin or whore, lose-lose binary, and in Latin America, the male counterpart is called machismo, or male exaggerated aggression, arrogance, and intransigence. Its female counterpart, marianismo, is the subject of today's lesson. We're going to discuss four items in today's lesson. Number one, division of labor and gender negotiations. Number two, marianista iconography, which predates Christianity. Number three, social manifestations of Marianismo. And number four, syncretism between Guadalupe and Tonatzin, the Aztec mother goddess. For today's lesson, I am going to be relying heavily on an article by Evelyn Stevens called Marianismo, the other face of machismo. And as you can see, it is heavily annotated because it's been taught several times at Pace University. Heavily annotated. Seriously. Okay, so let's get to it. In terms of division of labor, there is no natural law that justifies cultural divisions of labor. There's nothing biological about men or women that predisposes one for one job or another for the other job. A community's majority arbitrarily decides which behaviors are good or bad. And some of the criteria that they use to establish these behaviors are age, sex, class, among others. Machismo, or the cult of virility, and Marianismo, the cult of spirituality, have been collectively harmful in Latin America when regulating a person's gender. The iconography of Marianismo is actually the iconography of fertility, and it is in many ways fallopian. I know, there's no other way to put it. It's fallopian. Just, just take it. It's fallopian. Um, and another, a commenter in a previous episode asked if I could do a whiteboard, so we're gonna uh, do a, a little drawing whiteboard to show you. The Venus of Willendorf from the Upper Paleolithic, she has been around with us from 28,000 BC to 25,000 BC. That is presumably when the Venus of Willendorf is carved, and she's about yay big. Uh, notice that there is an emphasis on the breasts, the hips, alternatively the tummy. And in Christianity, that same space is underlined by the Christ child, so you have a double whammy right here. In some cases, the figure's arms, such as this Minoan snake goddess, are raised above her head, and you're not gonna lie, this kind of looks like a uterus. So, if we go back in time, to the mother goddess cults of the Mediterranean and Mesopotamia that passed to America with the conquistadors, you have a very long history of representing women's fertility and divinity with this kind of iconography. If you think of Ishtar in ancient Mesopotamia from the Epic of Gilgamesh, she is a sexual goddess, and in fact, it's the uh, the hero turning her down, turning down her sexual favors that sets out the whole plot line for <laughs> uh, the the last tablets of the Epic of Gilgamesh. We also have uh, Hathor. I didn't draw Hathor here, but I have one right here. The mother cow with her horns looks a lot, once again, like a uterus. This one is called the Minoan snake goddess, and she's from 1600 BCE from the island of Crete. And this one is inspired by Madonnas from the 1490s in the Italian Renaissance. We should also mention that there is an Iberian example uh, in archaeology called the Lady of Elche. She's from the 4th century BCE. I don't have her drawn here, but if you choose to look her up, she has these uh, giant Princess Leia buns on both sides of her head, and they look to be made of wheat, but once again, it replicates that raised arm position of the Minoan snake goddess. Now, the mother goddess is accompanied oftentimes by a husband-son, 
whose disappearance every year represents the seasons and is a metaphor for the cycle of birth and death and rebirth. In the winter, his absence makes the mother goddess or wife goddess into a sorrowful woman, the Mater Dolorosa, the pained mother. And he is used to um, design solar calendars, whereas she is more for lunar calendars. When Judaism and Christianity uh, pop around, they are patriarchal monotheistic religions. The mother ro goddess role turns auxiliary. In fact, when you codify the Old Testament into the, into the Hebrew Talmud, there is an abolishment of the Semitic pantheon, including many female goddesses that predate Jehovah Elohim, the one God. Uh, some of them are Asarath, Asarte, Anath, Sekina, Matronit, pardon me, we're in the middle of Brooklyn, so sirens are a thing. And back to uh, the Semitic goddesses, they need, the ancient Jews needed to eliminate these characters to unify the tribes in the Old Testament. So in a context of exile, it makes sense to have one god so that you don't have arbitrary orders coming from many sides. In early Christian hagiography, or the study of the saints, there is no place for the female figure. There is only Christology or Christolatry. So Christology is the study of Christ, Christolatry is the excessive admiration of Christ. In the Council of the Fessus in the year 431, the bishops at Ephesus decide and sanction that they can have Theotokos, or the Mother of God, as part of the canon of the church, as part of liturgy as well. And when they include her in Catholic uh, canon, her cult becomes so popular that it's he, she almost competes with Christ in every century. And she gets her own story, it's called Mariology, or the study of Mary, uh, or Mariolatry, which is the excessive adoration of Mary. So all the way from 431, her cult has been unbeaten, except by Christ. She is almost as popular and at times more popular than he is. Turns out people like female goddesses a lot. So when we get to America, you have a phenomenon called syncretism, which is the blending of cultural traits, and this can be easily seen in the Virgin of Guadalupe. Guadalupe appears to Juan Diego, a native, on the Mount Tepeyac five times from December 11th to December 26th, 1531. On this 1531 is only a decade after Cortés invades Tenochtitlan between 1519 and 1521. So it's not a surprise that the Catholic Church will eventually endorse a Native American version of Virgin Mary to procure more faithful for the Church. Um, Tepeyac, the mount where Guadalupe appears, is an ancient sacred site for Tonatzin, the serpent mother, the weeping mother, the mother of gods. So there are a lot of similarities and these two ladies blend for the mestizo, creole, um, Native American and African populations of Latin America and Mexico. Guadalupe becomes the patroness of New Spain in 1756, so she is endorsed officially. She's given that uh, title of saint in, 15, in 1756, my apologies. Um, as I said, she becomes a religious symbol and icon for the Creoles, the Mestizos, the Indians, and the Africans, and she is instrumental in the development of nationalism. Miguel Hidalgo, during the Mexican independence, carries her banner in 1811 into battle during the independence war. In fact, in the Grito de Dolores, the famous proclamation of freedom where he says, Viva Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe, muera el gobierno, mueran los cachupines, long live the Lady of Guadalupe, down with the bad government, death to the Spaniards. Uh, she is part of that declaration of independence. In fact, she is the first character that appears with it when they say, Viva Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe. And this leaves us with comparing machismo to marianismo. What are the characteristics? 
As I said, machismo is one, exaggerated aggression, two, male intransigence, and three, arrogance and aggression against women. If you've ever seen two men get into a fight or almost get into a fight, they'll get really close to each other and demand respect. Well, this is a form of machismo. You can't let the other guy be the top dog, otherwise you are humiliated publicly and your masculinity comes into question. Marianismo, its counterpart, is a multiracial cult where the Virgin informs the model of femininity across the Mediterranean and the Americas. These bipolar expectations allow women two personalities, the virgin before marriage and the pained mother after marriage and after the loss of a child or a husband. This cult of female spiritual superiority leads a lady into a path of chastity, ideally, humility, self-sacrifice, Sadness is a very important trait. If you look in Latin American telenovelas, the lady dressed in black is called uh, la viuda or the widow, and her role is to be sad as a form of self-abnegation. She is charged with family prayers, caring for the dead, uh, to the point where men are seen as unfit for long periods of mourning because they are como niños, they infantilize the male at the expense of the female. Imitation of Mary varies between social groups, because not every woman can afford to stay indoors to safeguard her honor. Working class and poor women had to go out, so their Marianismo is compromised by the fact that they are out and about, especially during the colonial period, where chaperoning of middle and upper class young women was common. Marianista sexuality forces the girl into premarital chastity, attainable mostly to urban and provincial middle classes and up. Male concerns about legitimacy and virginity and primogeniture encourage the men to seek a virgin as their bride. Most postnuptial frigidity of the good woman, uh, she has to pretend that she doesn't like sex, uh, that it, at least in the ideal. Th in fact, there is a whole metaphorical lexicon in Spanish for women to talk about sex without actually talking about it. For example, le hice el servicio. I did him the service means I, I, I spent the night with him because they don't they want to avoid using the taboo topic because that takes them away from that virginal uh, Guadalupe ideal. Acting like the Mater Dolorosa or the pained mother affects males, females, and family members differently. Full-blown Marianismo happens only after middle age. This explains how come uh, most Hispanics will tell you that their grandmothers are saints. But these Santas come with a projectile shoe attached to their hand that just flies at you. So grandma, in exchange for her self-abnegation, her sadness, her taking care of you and changing diapers when you were a baby, she gets to be the boss of the house. So whenever, <laughs> whenever you're getting yelled at and they call grandma, you know you're in trouble because they, they call the most powerful creature in their entire household. All classes want to attain this ideal of semi-divinity, moral superiority, spiritual strength, abnegation, humility, self-sacrifice, but the inverse it are negative traits like passive-aggressive, passive manipulative, underhanded to seem, seem likely reactions to this social pressure. The Marianista woman has infinite patience with her male relatives because they are como niños. Men apparently can't take care of themselves. Uh, they are submissive to the male kin, but they are cruel with their daughters and daughters-in-law. The Marianista woman, in turn, must submit to her mother and mother-in-law. So it creates this endless cycle of passive-aggressive. Take a look at a telenovela. You can't unhear what you just heard right here in Cronista de Indias. Her sadness means that she struggles violently to the end because male sinfulness damns the whole family. So her prayers actually allow male family members into purgatory. And eventually, by warming up Virgin Mary's ear up in heaven, you can get the guy to pass into heaven. So women have a metaphysical role in society, not just remaining chaste for their family's honor in this lifetime. 
Uh, last but not least, women's performance of mourning or wearing all black outlasts men, oftentimes by years. And it's because men are perceived as not having the spiritual stamina to wear black and be sad all the time. Now, this sounds all horrible, but there are some, some advantages to Marianismo. One, this place of devotion and admiration uh, gain the support of the community if the husband cheats. So people will guaranteed side with the lady. Number two, it gives women a security blanket of identity in a society that doesn't ne that might not necessarily have given a woman the chance to be a career woman. So it gives her an identity and it's pre-manufactured. Um, and last but not least, today in, 20th, in 21st century, uh, career women in Latin America may not necessarily um, have to pick between career and work. Employers might give them time off because they see it as respecting the sanctity of motherhood. And females in Latin America, unlike in the United States, might have other female kin living in their own household that assist with child rearing. Well, the next lesson, uh, one of the most extreme, bizarre, bizarre and entertaining and totally illogical manifestations of Marianismo in Latin America is conventual life. That's right. Nuns, religious women, beatas. Women ran entire, an entire economic sector of the Catholic Church in Latin America, and yet you probably know very little about them. Their institutions include in convents, Beaterios, Recogimientos, Orphanages, Third Orders, and Cofradías. To learn more about all of those wonderful nuns, uh, join me for next time, your very own Cronista de Indias for Latin American Divas, Season 1, Episode 5. We're up to 5! The Brides of Christ and Other Religious Women. If you like the channel, the content, or have a thought, leave a comment. Hit the subscribe button to join the revolution. Uh, tune in on Fridays because episodes hatch every Fridays. And remember, you gotta do epic shit. Otherwise, don't do anything. Do epic shit. Bye.